Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Let me start by um, thanking the executive committee of the Gayaza Old Girls Association, UK chapter, for organizing this spectacular evening. And, and to all of you, a big thank you for coming to support um, the cause of Gaza High School. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, of course, I wish to thank you for inviting me as your guest of honor. Uh, I did not come alone. I came with my daughters, but I think they're into photographs. <laughs> I, will, I will introduce them. They just went out at the wrong time. Uh, I will introduce them when they come back. Uh, I have two daughters, and they both are old Gaza girls. Yeah. Oh. As I. So as I was preparing my speech, um, I talked to Jennifer, and we wondered what I should speak about. And I considered sharing something to which every Gaza girl, past and present, might relate. As we raised to strive funds to put up another building block, on our beloved school. I thought I would share some of the lessons that I have learned on life's journey and how the core values that Gayaza High School imparted to all of us have been the wind beneath my wings that has propelled me to become the person that I am today. And in sharing, I hope that many more girls will have the opportunity to study at Gayaza and to benefit from the same training and values that we did. For those of you who did not have the good fortune of going to Gayaza High School, uh, it is an all-girls boarding school in Kampala, Uganda, founded by the Christian missionaries of the church, the Christian missionaries of the Church Missionary Society of England in 1905. It is the oldest girls school in the country. The popularity of the school stems from its core values, including godliness, hard work, excellence, perseverance, humility, and integrity, to name by, but a few. Kayanza is a unique school where girls are not only taught to excel academically, but are also trained and prepared to achieve their highest potential as career women, as well as mothers and housewives. I don't know any other school in Uganda today that offers that kind of uh, training opportunity. But first, I need to tell you a little bit about my life growing up and where I come from. I was born in a sleepy little village called Chiwafu in Entebbe, where nothing exciting ever happens. The year in which I was born, of course, is not of public interest. <laughs> but if you are really curious, it's on Google. <laughs> I was born in a family of four siblings. Uh, which was unusually conservative in those days, as many Baganda families had anything between 6 to 15 children. That was not unusual. My, my parents, my father spoiled us rotten. And what we lacked in discipline from him, my mother more than made up for her, for it, in her conservative and regimented style of her, of her bringing. Her philosophy was, spoil the rod and spoil the child. My mother was the kind of mom who would send away the house help, who incidentally we were never allowed to call the house help, because we always called her Mama Salima, and we had one growing, one house help growing. So as soon as we would come home for holidays, Mama Salima would have her holidays would begin. And she would come back the day after we returned to school. I cannot tell you who of the four siblings was the naughtiest or the laziest, but I can tell you that I was the most outspoken one, and I often paid dearly.
for my early advocacy skills at home. <laughs> I vividly remember this one morning when it was my turn to do the dishes at home, as was customary in our home. But I decided that I had had enough domestic servitude. <laughs> I had it at school, I had it at home. Yes. So, anyway, I was nine years at the time. So my petulant self ran to my father, demanding that he free us from mother, whom I had discovered was actually our stepmother in disguise. <laughs> and I demanded that he should take all of us away to live with our real mother. Unbeknownst to me, mother was in earshot and heard the whole conversation that morning. I leave you to imagine what followed. <laughs> Suffice it to say that I did dishes for the rest of the month. <laughs> and that was the lighter part of my punishment. Mm -hmm. So between my doting father, my loving but disciplinarian mother, and Gayaza High School, they managed to mold me into the individual that I turned out to be today. So fast forward to the days of Gayaza High School that we all fondly remember. Remember the early morning housework that trained us to appreciate that living in a clean environment and helping with the school chores was just as important as attaining academic excellence. Gayaza taught us the value of hard work, both physically and academically. It is still the only place on earth where a 12-year-old senior one student is required to peel a whole bunch of matoke plus a devi of cassava and sweet potatoes in 45 minutes of housework early in the morning when most of us are barely awake. Remember having to pick stones from a whole devi of rice or having to wash up the dishes for a whole school within 30 minutes before prep. Yes. Or cleaning out the cow pens early in the morning while you sneezed yourself crazy from the ammonia. I am certain there's no other school in the world that gives such training to their students. I often quietly wondered though, if the teachers at Gayaza did not devise some of the housework tips from my mother. <laughs> but there were also happier times and moments in class, sports and recreation with Miss Ann Cutler, music with Miss Hopday, community work in the village around, around us, the social evenings in schools like King's College Budo and others, <laughs> Saturday night movies and those Shakespearean plays, oh, yeah. and Sunday chapel, the singing, the choir, those were happy times. Through all of these activities, the school imparted the, the important values that would mold our character and prepare us for the future. In particular, I will share a few examples of how those values have helped me in my own life. Many of the lessons I'm about to share will probably sound like common sense to many of you, but believe you me, it has taken me the greater part of my adult life to actualize them to my benefit. Although I have learned many lessons, I will share with you only six tonight. The first lesson that Gayaza taught was to be visionary, focused, and hardworking. We were taught that success in life is about taking advantage of opportunity choice and timing and when you think about it that is exactly what success is at gayaza you are encouraged to have a clear vision of what you want to do with your life i must admit that it took me a while to figure out what this meant in practical terms and although for the earlier part of my life i drifted along with peer pressure i soon learned that every successful career be begins with a decision of what you want to be or to do with your life. The goals that you want to achieve, short term, mid term, long term. It must be your vision, not that of your parents, peers, or even spouse. Because ultimately, it is you 
who will have to bring this vision to reality. Without a vision for your life, you will easily drift through life, resentful and feeling as if you are simply existing and that life has shortchanged you. Surprisingly, it is my mother, the same mom I was telling you about, who actually was my real mother. She was never my stepmother. <laughs> so it was her who, despite her own limited education, inculcated in me and my siblings the faith that I could become anything that I set my mind upon, provided I focused and worked hard at it. I also credit my parents and Gaza High School for encouraging me, regardless of gender or social class, to strive to attain my highest potential. Throughout my career, it became clear that success comes not by genius, but rather by hard work and determination. At school, I was an average student, as far as grades go. But I was hardworking and determined to succeed. And that accounts for where I am today. Surprisingly, many of my former classmates at university, who seemed like geniuses at the time, either aren't doing so well career-wise, or simply did not make it in life. And this encourages me that anybody can succeed if you focus and put your mind to it. The second lesson that we, we were taught, both at home and at Gayasa, was to be resourceful and to maximize one's potential. I was taught to make the, mess of, the, the most of opportunities and resources that life has given us. Now, once I figured out what I wanted to do with my life, I have never shrunk or shied away from looking for opportunities to enhance my career. I have learned that while I'm required to do my current job to the best of my ability, I can also look out for opportunities for further training and specialization, as well as up upward mobility. I have learned to seize opportunities. And by seizing opportunities, I refer to legitimate opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> and to take advantage of the right timing. It is important when in a given position to take time to gather all the skills, knowledge, and experience that that position offers. There is no such thing as a useless skill or experience. Because in the end, all those skills come in handy. Uh, I would have given you examples, but I think in the, in the booklet that's been passed around, um, there are, there's a little bio about me. I haven't seen the bio, but uh, in there, you know, you'll see that I have quite a colorful past. I've done many things, and you would think, how does this relate to that and to the other? But they all do relate, and all the skills that I have gathered have, believe me, I still use them to this day. Uh, in the job that I do. Um, however, gathering skills and experience requires patience, often entailing spending sp several years in the same line of work. You remember the saying that says that a rolling stone gathers no moss. These days, a lot of young people do not have the patience or the perseverance to stay in one job for a decent period of time often distracted by monetary benefits elsewhere. I learned very early on that money is not everything. There are other considerations and benefits, such as job satisfaction, opportunities for scholarships, exposure, and acquisition of skills that one ought to consider. While we all long for well-paying jobs, we must accept that one has to start with humble beginnings. And the skills and experience that one acquires from a, a seemingly poor paying job may in the end prove priceless. Um, money is good, and I applaud those of you who have worked hard and earned good wealth. However, the danger of making money your object is that after a while, it surely chokes and overtakes your dream and vision. In my experience, I've considered that one must work in a job for a minimum of three to five years in the same line of work, enabling you to pick up the necessary skills. 
and then you know you move on. I also encourage you uh, to look for opportunities to improve your qualifications. There's always, you know, the sky is the limit uh, if you want to improve yourself. I also learned that the friends one keeps can make or break you. It has been said that you are the average of the five friends that you keep. Or whose company you keep. If your close friends are not focused, or are not people of integrity, don't expect to turn out differently. The older I have grown, the fewer friends I, ha I have. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> the third lesson that we learned at Gayaza was perseverance and tenacity. You know, just keep on keeping on. The high school motto for Gayaza is never give up. But what in practical terms does that mean? I have learned that life is about taking risks and having the faith, courage, fortitude, steadfastness, and tenacity to follow through with one's dreams. There's a nice Luganda word, okure mirako, which translates into being tenacious. In pursuing your goals, don't be afraid to take risks and believe in yourself. You see, there's a big crowd of enemies waiting to see you fail and sometimes actively work to pull you down. If you're not tenacious, you may easily give up. Let no one despise you on account of your age, gender, tribe, race, or any other stereotype out there. Personally, if someone had told me that a young girl from a humble family in Kiwafu village in Entebbe would one day be the first African female judge in the world court. Hmm. I would probably <laughs> And there are many examples I would give you, but for, for uh, reasons of time constraint, I probably would not. But I have to tell you something about this court where I work now, which I think will probably be my it's, 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 it's the top. I, I don't think I can go further than that. This is a court that has been um, around for since 1945, since the Second World War. Um, it's called the World Court because it uh, decides disputes between states, countries, not people, not individuals. It's often confused with the International Criminal Court that people are more aware of, uh, where incidentally my daughter Sanyu works. <laughs> now my daughters are back in the house. <laughs> Sanyu Ndagira, please, please stand. <laughs> so her younger sister Grace uh, is, is in Uganda with, with their dad. Um, they couldn't be here, but the two girls are all there as a girls. But I have an adopted daughter in the house. Um, Shaka, she's American. She's lived with us in The Hague, and she's now here. Shaka, she's here. In every way, I am her mother, away from home. Not the stepmother. Not the stepmother. <laughs> so, anyway, I was telling you about this, this, this court. Um, historically, there's been about maybe 300, 500 judges, I think, that have worked in this court. Uh, over a period of 70 something years. Uh, and all of them have been men, and I might add elderly Caucasian men. Yes. And I think the first woman was a British judge, a Dame Rosalind Hawkins, in the year 1999. Imagine from 1945, the first woman judge was. Uh, went, was ascended to the court in 1999, and she served, she served out her term well, but it was a lonely term for her. When she first went to the court, there were no toilets for women, and she would have periodically to run to her flat to go to the bathroom. And for six months, nobody realized she was doing this, to change, maybe to designate one of the bathrooms. And the next, bunch of women, 
three women is in the 2000s, and that includes myself. There's an American judge lady, and a Chinese lady, and then myself. For me, I am particularly proud because I, I think it took me an awful lot of courage, sincerely speaking. Courage and faith in myself. I could hear my mother's encouragement. The process of getting elected to this court is not an easy one uh, because you have to campaign literally the whole world in all the, the 197 member states of the United Nations. You have to tell them about yourself. You have to explain. It's a bottom-up uh, kind of a process. You start with the ambassadors of those countries and then finally you wind up in New York. It's a time-consuming, financial, uh, financially involved process uh, where you have to convince them because at the end of the day, they have to vote for you in the General Assembly and in the Security Council. And if you do not get a majority, you don't get the job. So even now, I look back six years ago when I took that bold step. First of all, I looked through the website to see if there was anyone that looked like me as if that would help. There wasn't. <laughs> and what I saw was more discouraging that, than encouraging. But somehow I kept believing in myself. And I kept saying to myself, as my mama would always say, what is the worst that can happen? They can only say no. It's not going to kill you. And that was the philosophy that also you know, drove me forward every time. That was not the first risk that I ever took. I took another risk earlier on. When I was a student here in the UK, uh, in the early 1990s, there was a job advertised by the Commonwealth Secretariat for someone in my line of work. And I was a student. I just started my master's degree. I wasn't even sure I was going to pass. But I, advert I, I applied. And I said, I hope to get my master's degree like in December of next year or something like that. <laughs> and I thought, they're going to laugh, but the, re the, the best they'll do or the worst is throw my application in the bin. That's it. To my utter shock, within three days, I had a response offering me the job. They were aware that I was going to um, graduate like the following year, and they told me they were willing to wait. I had no godfathers in the Commonwealth Secretariat, but it's a risk I took. And then I was scared, what if I don't make this degree, what am I going to say? You know, but all in all, my eyes were fixed. I was, um, I was focused on, on, on never giving up. But I, I, digress, I digressed. Um, I want to continue with the lessons that uh, uh, I have learned. Uh, the, uh, the fourth lesson was excellence and ambition. Both at home and at Diaza, I was taught to strive for excellence and to avoid mediocrity in all that I do. If you want to leave your mark in life, you cannot afford to settle for mediocrity. If you set out to do a job, do it well or don't do it at all. Do not do something simply because everybody does it. Or do it in a certain way just because that's the way everybody does it. The trouble with today's generation, in my view, especially in Uganda today, is that we have stopped pursuing excellence, even in our education system, and we are satisfied with doing the bare minimum that can earn us the best pay. You can see mediocrity in our education system, our civil service, our health services, our universities, even our leaders in government. Mediocrity manifests itself, itself in sloppy work, lateness for work, taking shortcuts, including corruption, etc. In my experience, working both nationally and internationally, I have found that I've often had to earn respect from my peers and workmates. Earn respect. You know the saying that Africans don't keep time? Well, many of my non-African peers will not say it to you, but you can see it in their eyes if you come late for work or come unprepared to court. Your whole race gets blamed for your indiscretions. 
Throughout my career, I have purpose to be punctual for work, to adequately prepare before going to court. Shaka knows that. She works with me. And to ensure that my output is up to standard. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to look good while you're at it. As a working mother and housewife, maintaining excellence while at the same time trying to multitask is not easy. Sometimes we bite off more than we can chew. And thank God for house help and for all those machines that help to ease our chores and our work. However, I have news for you. It is possible to excel at work and also to take care of your family effectively. But the secret is in learning to prioritize. Personally, my family has always come first and my job second. When I come from home, when I come home from court, I grab my apron and I'm in the kitchen trying to prepare a delicious and balanced meal for the family. I must confess though that lately, Sanyo, my daughter and I, have done a lot of warming up of my own. <laughs> this is leftovers for dinner as we both come home very late and tired and we have homework to do. There's absolutely nothing wrong with my own, but... <laughs> so what, what I usually do, um, like now in the Hague, Saturdays and Sundays are the days that I cook for the entire week. I cook a number of sauces, a number of dishes, and I just freeze them and you know for the week. So at least we have a choice. It's Maoru, but there's a choice. <laughs> so that's what I, I would do on, on a Saturday or a Sunday. So from the start, I took a decision that as long as my, da my daughters were still young, and by young I mean pre-university, I would be available for them full time and would not accept any job that entailed traveling away from home. I do not regret the investment I made. I started accepting work that took me away from home long after they had completed university. Speaking of excellence and juggling career at home, I also believe that a mother and wife should not leave the cleanliness of her home or feeding and nurturing of her family to the house help entirely. That is, when they are, that is why they are called house help <laughs> and not substitutes. I enjoy living in a clean house, even if I have to do it myself. And I enjoy cooking a good meal for my family. Again, successful multitasking is a question of being organized. Simple things like planning your weekly menu in advance, chopping up and freezing the vegetables for the week, pre-cooking certain foods as I've explained, getting the children and husband to clean up after themselves, all these are gimmicks that help you to cope with the challenges. <laughs> the fifth lesson, and I'm, I'm almost closing, that we learned was humility and integrity. At home and at Gayaza, I was taught that one's name is one's greatest possession. Do you believe that? Yes. At first, I did not understand the weight of that statement, but over time, I have come to appreciate the value of integrity. Integrity entails honesty, moral uprightness, dependability, and being a person of your word. It is no secret that in our country today, integrity is a rare commodity, it's in short supply. Mm -hmm. And sadly, our young people have few role models, models to emulate. I also strongly believe that, the, that, the, that integrity is one of the values that starts right in the home. And if we bring up our children to be truthful, morally upright, and dependable from a very early age, they will not depart from it when they are grown. I hasten to add that as parents, we are the greatest role models that our children will ever see. In the legal profession, we often are accused of having integrity deficit, and probably rightly so. It is possible to carry out your profession in an honest and clean way that honors God and your fellow man. Like integrity, be classy. <laughs> Humble people are endangered species in Uganda. Humility simply means 
learning to keep your success in perspective and remembering that you are neither the first nor the last to reach where you are. That is humility. The last and in my view most important value was godliness or is godliness. And that's the value I'd like to end with in this little presentation. Which again, which value was again inculcated in me, both at home and at Gayaza. Over the years I have learned to honor God and to honor my profession by serving faithfully. I believe the majority of us here do believe in a, a power higher than ourselves. And if I stood here today and told you that I have achieved all these successes in my own strength, I'll be the greatest liar. I stand before you today as one who has been saved by the grace of God Amen. and who has come to understand that God can direct my path daily. When you honor God, he not only guides your choices, but he also blesses and rewards your efforts. In my line of work, I never walk into a courtroom trusting in my own wisdom or abilities. I pray and ask God to give me the wisdom of Solomon, that is, knowing what to do at a, in a particular situation. I also pray for him to grant me favor amongst my peers and to walk with me every day. I speak into my day and I download success and blessings into the day. Before we gather in the morning with my peers, I arrive early in the meeting room and quietly dedicate the court and our work before the Lord. I bind all negativity and confusion and I invite his spirit to dwell amongst us. The day I neglect to do so, chaos and confusion takes over. And God reminds me today, you forgot to pray when you arrived late. So, in conclusion, I cannot conclude without acknowledging my family. My husband, John Sebutinde, and my daughter, Sanyu Dakile, and Grace Namtevi, who have unreservedly supported me at home and throughout my career. And without her support, I definitely would not be where I am today. I also acknowledge and thank all those teachers at Gaza High School who poured their lives into us, into each one of us, and who probably will never know the value of what they taught us. They will never know. Maybe they follow um, our careers, or maybe they don't. But they really poured their lives into us, and I thank God for them. Once again, I want to thank Jennifer and the whole organizing committee for honoring me, giving me an opportunity to share my life's lessons with you. And I wish guys, the All Girls Association all the success in, in this endeavor that we are all, all doing. I encourage all of you to continue supporting the school. I thank you and I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you.